Hello, Camp Pros, and welcome to the Camp Hacker Podcast. My name is Travis Allison from Go Camp Pro, from the Summer Camp Professionals Group on Facebook, and from CampMavericks.com. Hi, my name is Dan Weir. I've been working in overnight and day camping for over two decades now, I, and primarily in YMCA camping, and I work for the YMCA of Long Island, developing our five day camps. And my name is Gabrielle Rail. I'm one of the camp directors at Camp Waro. And Camp Waro is an all-girls camp situated in the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec, Canada. And we focus on creating a positive female environment. And we do that all speaking in French and in English. And my name's Joe Richards. I'm the executive director at Pierce Williams, which is a summer camp and retreat facility located in Ontario. And is part of the United Church of Canada's camping network of 57 camps across the country. Um, and I also wrote the Camp Counselor Manifesto. Yay. I'm Jaleesa Danhoff. I'm the director at Camp Nuevo. We're an all-girls overnight camp in Western Michigan. And I'm also the national chair of EPIC, which is Emerging Professionals in Camping for the American Camp Association. And welcome back, Jaleesa. It's great to have you back on Camp Actor. Thanks. So excited to talk about today's topic. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, with uh, Thanks to you for suggesting it. So we wanted to talk today about um, other sources of income. We're not going to limit it much more than that. I think there's lots of possibilities here. And this is for other camps, um, for camps to get ideas, some stuff that all of us have seen or, or that we have been at camps that are doing particular things. Um, what I'd like to open up with is just a, a challenge to you as a, as a listener. Um, I think that the idea of creating or getting other sources of income probably makes sense to, to most everybody. Um, I know Joe in particular has spoken about how the other programs that happen at Pierce Williams subsidize the summer camp pro program. It's so important that it is a, a part of the subsidy of the, the camp programs. But I would say that my, my opening challenge to you, we're going to share tons of good ideas, but my opening challenge to you as a, as a listener, as a YouTube watcher, is to say, carefully evaluate what this means. Um, taking on other programs, if you've just been a summer camp for years and you're just thinking about other sources of income, or maybe you've done some rentals or you've you know had some weekend groups, et cetera, and you're looking at some bigger programmings, bigger programs, do the math. Um, there's lots of good resources, lots of people to talk to us, um, people on Camp Pros, et cetera, that can help with the math of how this works. But um, I do know lots of camps who have gone into extra sources of income without thinking about how much it was going to cost them, what the staffing would be worth, that just said, this is going to be, or insurance, you know, just, just said, you know, this could be an extra $30,000 a year, and hey, we could all use $30,000 a year. And I must say, also, in thinking about that conscientiously, I have so much respect for Joe when he got to Pierce Williams, who said, we're doing summer camp only, weekend rentals, which was separate, but, but the, the camp staff are doing summer camp only for now until um, Joe got settled and, and things got on the right footing and then expanded into more programming. And um, big, big kudos to you for, for that um, thoughtfulness, Joe. Yeah, and I had a just a, a quick story. I used to work somewhere and they, part of it is that not just the math of what it will cost you, but the math of, is it really worth your time? Right. Right. If you're a summer camp that generates two to three million dollars a year in in as a company in that two months pan that you run, how important is running for an additional month to make thirty thousand right. dollars? Because thirty thousand dollars is really just like, you know, five to ten campers gets you that money um, and you eat it into your, your regular costs. So it's it's. <sighs> It's one of those things where the stress you put on your your staff and the expectation you put on your 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 full time staff, especially, can really um, be detrimental to your overall camp culture if it's something that's brand new. Right. Right. Uh, so I'm I'm interested in and anybody can jump in just in terms of philosophy or developing new programs or things that people might not think of. What are some of the things you think that that camps could miss or, or you have seen them miss in the past? I, I know for U.S. camps, a lot of people do not think about state regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you the amount of conversations I've had where, no, I, 
I don't think you can do that. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, it's illegal. And, right. <laughs> yeah. and uh, it's a funny conversation. I would kind of say it bombastically to, to get people's attention. But like, um, you know, if you're in New York State, if you're running a camp program outside of camp and you have a, a Office of Children and Family Services license, you need to consult with that office. Um, if you're in a state like North Carolina where it has like very little regulation, then, you know, like you don't have to worry about this. There's not much federal regulation, but there is a lot of state laws to protect children. They're there for good reasons, but would prohibit you from running something without double checking or getting your staff background checked again or having your water tested again. So it just, you know, I really ask a lot of questions about where you're living and how this affects the laws in that, that area. I think from a philosophical standpoint, you can also look at it as a way to expand your mission. So if you're able to do additional year round programming, if you have that capacity, if you have that facility, if you have staff that are willing to look at that on a on a basis that grows in an appropriate way. Um, for us, it's a way to expand our mission to the local community, which we don't serve as much. I know so much of Joe's camp is made up of local campers. For us, that's not as much the case, and we feel somewhat isolated from our local community if we weren't running programs that attracted people to come to camp in the quote unquote off season. We feel like we're able to get more impact and really drive home our mission uh, through programs, which also brings in income. Yeah, that's a, a great point, Lisa. Um, and it's fun to see how all the cool things that Noego does for the local community um, and your outreach there. So I, I guess then um, I'd be open to anybody else's ideas, but I, I guess then I would love to start to think about just kind of jam on what are some things you've seen work and what are some things that have um, maybe, actually, let's not start there. Let's start with things that you've seen not work. And um, for yourself, your other programs, other camps directors that you've talked to, and let's let's end off on the positive with things that, that have worked really well. Mm -hmm. I okay. We, uh, we did, so for things that didn't work at Waro, we did, um, we did school groups. <laughs> we did, uh, our previous director uh, did a, um, a reunion called, um, what is it called? Dal Dalmatian stock. Yeah, it was a, basically all Dalmatian dogs um, on our camp. Uh, <laughs> talking about, uh, talking Jaleesa about. Jaleesa is uh, all over that. Yeah, Jaleesa, talking about value systems. I and mean, th these things didn't fit necessarily right within in what we what we did. And what we realized was exactly what Jaleesa was talking about. We were sort of throwing stuff on, on the wall and seeing what would stick. And instead, what we really should have been doing, which we ended up doing, is focusing on our mission and how can we make that more of a focus. So uh, school groups didn't work for us because, because to invite co-ed camps, we needed to have male staff members. And obviously, primarily, most of our staff members are female. So we had to hire outside, train them, um, all of that access work. Uh, we were breaking pretty much even almost. Um, and then we were burning our staff out our leadership team before the summer started. So we really had to scrap all of these programs, um, in, including Dalmatian stock, and, um, and look at what, what can we do in short bursts um, that would hit our, hit our uh, mission statement, which I can talk about later in the up and up. Excellent, yeah. love that. I've seen camps that, um, that just like like Gab said, throw it all at the wall. They're just like, I have this facility, I can do everything. Um, right. I'm going to run a ukulele camp and a quilt camp and a and a this camp and a that camp. And and in the end, there's no cohesive message, and and that's part of the problem because our clients don't always want something different. So even for campers here running a, a winter camp or running a March break camp, we found that our parents just aren't interested in it. Um, because it turned here, the weather in Southwest Ontario just turns into mud camp, but, um, but also you can't fill it. And so when you, when you start to put together how many staff you need for it and the food and everything, you're barely breaking even. And it's just a, right, there's, you could, 
could I focus more of my energy on getting 10 or 20 more campers to our summer camp program where that income is already, you know, would increase our income, but it's, it's built into a system that already exists and we already staff. Staffing is a key point to bring up right now. You know, it, um, again, U S labor laws are, are crazy. And once you get to a certain point, um, uh, you have to change how you pay. You have to change uh, what type of insurance you have for people, what type of uh, you know, disability, depending on what state you're in, uh, health insurance. I, I just, yeah, uh, I'm not trying to scare people out of year-round business, but you have to be extremely calculated. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of camps that have looked into it and just said, I don't have the facilities for it and the staffing costs would just drill up. Um, and it's, in my mind, it's, you know, like when it's warm out, it's easy to have a group. But when you have a group there and it's freezing and you don't have the ability to basically have them, um, the, those costs of heat will drive up a group um, uh, cost dramatically. It will change reputation. I, I just, I can't bring it up enough that how important it is. And we, we, I felt when we were doing school groups, one of the reasons why we did it, and this was, you know, about 15 years ago, but was that I was feeling pressure from other camp directors to say, how can you be missing out on such a financial opportunity? And I was like, I don't know how I could be, I should be doing this. And yeah. uh, I just saw so many other camps doing it. And I, I thought I'm being irresponsible. I, I could really be, be putting this together. And, and sometimes we're seeing what other organizations are doing, but ju just where we live, um, it is easily a 10 degrees Celsius difference between Montreal and our camp. It's an hour, it's an hour and a half drive. That's different. So some camps are closer to Montreal. It makes sense. But even last year when we tried to open up our facility to have uh, some of our staff training, um, because of weather, because the ground was frozen, we had to run a weekend training in Montreal. So I think that that kind of, that's the you, you, we also get influenced by our peers. We get influenced by other yeah. organizations, and we say, "Okay, let's let's uh, let's let's do this." Um, instead of really sitting down, and looking at the angles, as you were talking about, Dan, the the regulations, um, the law, the finances, the yeah, weather, yeah, yeah. all of those things. And the, the previous place I, I worked at, um, people would come visit all the time because we were known for serving people year round, and. Um, I, I can't tell you how many tours I gave where at the end of it, uh, to, to camp professionals that would be like, oh yeah, I don't know if I should be operating year round because like just heat alone. I mean, I, I, I can't reiterate, like, you know, this was in the Catskill Mountains and, um, you know, the buildings that were designed great for summer camp in terms of keeping it cool are also giant. And uh, to heat those buildings, it just, people do not think it through. And, you know, like, it also changes the design of your buildings. Um, so the, uh, like, here's a great example is, um, you know, school groups love to hang out together. Family groups love to hang out together. They always want a common space, uh, preferably with a fireplace. That might look great nine months a year, but when you're having a camp cabin, it doesn't, it takes away the intimacy in some aspects, um, no matter what way you dice it up. There are some ways you could design it and that meet its function. But when you're designing your buildings for mul multiple purposes, it takes away from the summer camp. And that, and to be honest with you, the place I was at, we were okay with that. We were totally okay with that. Um, we were cognizant, but the summer camp actually floated the place year round. It, it was for lack of better words, the cash cow that allowed for us to serve some A school groups. And we earnestly believed that everybody having a camp experience, whether it was three days versus um, you know, a whole summer, it didn't matter just coming up to camp. So I, I just can't reiterate enough, we've talked about it over and over again. It's not the, um, the gold that people uh, think it is. You know, that there's a lot of costs for it and there's a lot of things that it changes. At the same point in time, it was great working at a place that could always serve people. So, um, yeah. And, and I think that if you, if you have a camp that's for profit, that you also need to evaluate what you're charging your families before you start adding on these um, other programs that don't have to do with your summer program. And um, this isn't, this isn't um, for all organizations, but a lot of the times camp owners are nervous to raise their their price, pricing because you're going to exclude certain people or people are going to go somewhere else. But, 
but looking at, at how your own company is evaluating that financial need. Is there areas where you can cut costs? Is there areas that maybe we need to be charging more? Do we need to work a little bit more on our fundraising instead of creating um, just programming? But do that evaluation first. I'm not suggesting to do that. I'm just saying evaluate that piece before you start putting in um, secondary or third or uh, programs uh, around year round. Well, and the other thing is to not, you need to know who you are, right? This is the same thing I say to summer staff every year. Who, who do you like better, who you are at camp or who you are at school? Choose one of those people and be that, pe that person all the time. And so when you're a facility, you sort of have to have that same mindset, right? Who are you and what do you do? So if what I do is summer camp and I happen to also do rentals, that's fine. But know that this is the bathroom you're going to get as a rental. So if you're going to rent me for a wedding, I'm not going to spend five to ten thousand dollars upgrading my bathrooms just to please you um, until I've gotten to like twenty weddings, and then I can you know build a, a wedding specific building. And so I think there's a movement. I know in United Church Camping in Canada there is a movement that that is full time people. Um, hiring a full-time executive director will save your camp. People and buildings don't save camps in that sense, right? Um, it can certainly help to have a full-time staff, and it can certainly help to have a winterized building if you're trying to do things in the winter, but the reality is location, location, location are what is going to determine a lot of your off-season use. So Nuego and Waro are not close to anything in relation to like somebody who can get there in 20 minutes, right? Like when you think about that. And so when I think of Pierce Williams, we're just blessed with the fact that I did the math recently within a, within an hour's drive, we have almost a million people that we can pull from in a two to two and a half hour drive. That number jumps to 7 million people if I, and that's not even including Michigan, right? Like if I went, if I, so knowing where you're, where you're drawing from and knowing um, historically, right? Cause people do come, as Dan said, people will come and, and say, well, you're doing it. So we're just going to start doing it. And a few years ago, maybe five or six, I realized that um, Pierce Williams star, started, hired a full-time camp person in 1973 as a reference, 1973 is the year I was born. And so Pierce Williams is doing this for 46 years full to, with a full-time person. And, and I'm like, we just, we have a head start. And it's, and there's a lot of lessons we've learned and are still learning. Um, and it's not the end all be all, right? Like it is. Um, so you need to be careful of all those things and, and recognize who you are and what you're gonna do before you go into those programs. I know one thing that hasn't worked for us at Nuego is also thinking about the type of rental groups that you'll allow at your facility, what that does to your facility usage wise and your relationship with your neighbors. So just for instance, we rented a couple years to an adults only open bar summer camp weekend. You might have seen these pop up on your Facebook yes. ads. Um, <laughs> this particular group is now defunct due to bankruptcy uh candidly and has is under new ownership uh this group was not a good fit for us at nuego because it was a nightmare for our staff to run created some pretty unsafe situation situations and goes back to the liability piece that dan was speaking about of being aware anytime that you're renting especially with alcohol on your camp and all of those regulations that that implies a lot of these programs like weddings or you know women's retreats want to have alcohol as part of their rental if they're going to go on a a weekend somewhere and rent a lodge that's what they're anticipating so is your camp prepared to deal with that liability with those regulations and with the wear and tear that a group drinking alcohol it impacts your facility in a different way that youth campers do um, so there's a lot of policies that need to be established before you just say, yeah, let's try that. Um, Cause that group for us was a not invited back. Yep. That sounds crazy. 
Um, I think we can all imagine. And I imagine also too, as um, more states and now Canada, as marijuana is legal, cannabis is legal everywhere, that that's also more adult, pol more policy around adult stuff um, that we have to consider and learn the lessons from those camps that have led the way in states that have been legal longer than um, some of the others of us. So uh, some cool ideas, things you've seen. I know that um, that each one of you have had some awesome successes and that's why I'm grateful to have this, but I wonder if there's some things that you have seen that might surprise people in terms of good rentals um, that might be unusual. Uh, I'm happy to start off um, with that. Dan, you've got one? Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I've actually noticed a lot of crafting um, camps now or crafting yep. weekends. Yeah. Quilting. Uh, um, yeah, so quilters, um, also sewers, you know, like the, um, and also just uh, um, uh, like just ones that are running crafting in general. Um, there's so many people that want to learn how to craft. And uh, like you can actually, we actually had ours like even volunteer driven where it's just, it was camp parents um, really owning it and running it. Um, so that, that's something I've really noticed um, take off. Um, I've also noticed uh, you know, a lot of churches and um, uh, are trying to actually get like singles together, which is pretty funny because so it's not some of the issues you have with the alcohol that, you, um, that you're talking about with this other group. Um, but uh, it's a group of people that just want to get together and have a camp experience. So, yeah, um, th those are two funny groups I've noticed pop up in the past five years that have grown in popularity. Singles camp is hilarious. Yeah. yeah. It's such a great idea. Everybody's chilled out and relaxed. And Yeah. Yeah. Let's do a yeah. church. So, like, the demographic is typically a little bit more a following of rules. Right. Like better words. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Gab, you have something. Yeah, I, um, well, I think if, I think I, I would suggest go to um, if this is an option for you, go to an go to a camp, sign up for some of their programs, and participate. And a lot of camps will extend that if you're not in direct competition. So, for example, Winona invited myself, Camp Winona, uh, who is in, in in Ontario, invited uh, my mother and I to go to a women's weekend and. We, we wouldn't be in competition for Women's Weekend simply because of, of uh, you know, geographical uh, situations, you know, they're, they're 10 hours away from us. And just seeing how this camp ran their program gave us, we didn't do what, what Winona did, but it really gave us a starting point. So we ended up doing Women's Weekends because what we were making from a five-day um, uh, school group, we could make uh in a three-day women's weekend and right. three-day meaning it's it's actually really two days because they come yeah. in the evening they stay saturday they leave um sunday morning um yeah. because we don't need the ratios for the staff members and all of the all of our uh workshop leaders they get the weekend for free um and they can bring a friend and so we have quality workshop leaders that are artists uh, who are chefs, um, who are um, just a whole bunch of really neat, neat ladies that do really, really, really cool stuff, photographers, and they enjoy the, the, play, the, the weekend, and that's how we keep our, our costs low. So um, sometimes we think, oh, five days, that's going to equal this amount of money, but because of our staff. So Women's Weekends is super simple, and you can angle it that this weekend is more of a creative weekend, this weekend is more of a sports weekend, um, but but my suggestion would be to to go to a camp and experience some of these programs first, so then can can give you a good idea on how to run your own. That's awesome. One unusual one that I have seen, or surprising one, but I thought was so smart, um, was a camp here in Ontario who has set up to be um, the training grounds for a canine unit for a, um, a police service agency. And they have their own, they've, in the end, they've built their own buildings and just kennels for the dogs, but they use the whole site. And, um, and I'm not sure how much they pay for that, but it, it does allow, it does mean that emergency services are very familiar with their facility. And um, they have, um, 
they, they have police units in there for positive reasons very often. So they all know the site and that's a good security thing for them, but um, fun to be on site and watch the canine training that happens in their facility. So I think it's a really cool, thoughtful uh, and unusual thing that they've been able to do. I, I certainly know that um, some camps have other fire and rescue people do training on their, their facilities, but this one is a permanent um, a permanent agreement with this police uh, department doing canine training on their site. Yeah, I think that um, things I've seen, I when I toured Australian camps, uh, the grade 12 year would do a trip every, so every grade 12 student in Australia goes away for a week. I forget what they call the week, but every camp I was at in those two or three weeks had were full with just these trips. But it wasn't school programming. It's more like adult camp for grade 12 students, right? So it's this weird um, mix. Um, the thing that I would recommend, one of the things that uh, that that I think we're we're potentially glossing over a bit is this idea that we don't need to create the program. We just need to give people the space to create the program. Um, we can partner with them. So if I wanted to run, like a band camp would be something to do, like a ukulele camp or a banjo camp or a, um, um, you know, a music weekend in, in that sense where there's a learning and teachers, you can find people, um, but you need to think through um, your staffing and, and what you need for, for those things. But I think the idea is, because a lot of weekends that, um, you know, I've thought about weekends, but haven't run. So let's go with some ideas. Like, uh, I love the idea of a silent retreat. Um, um, Gab's gonna come down and do a silent retreat with me at some point. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And then we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, but But also the idea of these, the women's weekends and the like the father and son and um mm -hmm. so in ontario i know that our our girl guides and our boy scouts are struggling um and so some of those some of those places where you might have had um families singles so fathers and sons and, and girls and daughters get together and go to camp that's not going to exist anymore and so there is opportunity there and i've seen some camps be successful with that but the idea that we give space because we um <laughs> we rent a weekend a three-day weekend in august to a uh, denomination that shall remain nameless um that brings close to 200 people for uh, they show up Friday night and they leave Monday. And um, I have figured out over 12 years being with them that it's essentially a matchmaking weekend for people within the denomination. And it is a uh, blonde haired festival at Beers Williams <laughs> that weekend. And, um, you know, there's adults present and they, they run the program. We just walk away. But um, giving people that space is, is one way um, and finding those little niches where you can be, so day, an, a weekend program is good, but also day rentals if you're close enough, and that goes to location, right? So we do corporate retreats come and use some of our buildings um, without so much um, us running that program. I'll, I'll tag on to Joe. We run three mom, grandma, auntie and me camps at Nuego, and we've really packed in what camps will call our shoulder seasons, right? So Dan talked about like run programs and warm weather, if that works well. And our mom, grandma, auntie and me, we purposefully title it that and not just mom and me camp because we find that so many grandmothers have disposable income to spend on their grandkids. They will spend whatever it takes on their grandkids and they want to come with them and are, and are willing to take them away from, you know, the family unit to experience like a weekend of camp with them. It's a very short 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. time frame, and we run these in June before our overnight camp ramps up and it's a nice way to get some income in to add in staff earlier so it might not fill up um, a whole week's worth of staff time but if you can make enough on that weekend to hire in 
four or five leadership staff, they can then that week work on setting up camp for the season. Like that's a nice way to bring some income in shoulder season wise. Uh, we've also seen camps do really well with offering trainings like first aid CPR trainings, um, wilderness first aid trainings, American canoe kayak trainings out of their facility. Um, we often have instructors in our resources that we utilize for our programs to teach our staff or we are instructors ourselves. And then of course, always opening up your camp as potential sites for ACA trainings to do new director orientations or standards updates or OCA updates and standards. Uh, that's an organization camp directors are usually love to see other facilities and are pretty forgiving even of minimal facilities because they like to tour that. So that's a really easy way to get into rentals is by renting through our professional network. And nice that that it's camp people getting to see your property and we'll have a sort of realistic expectation of what that, that looks like. Cap, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Nope, I was just agreeing. I, oh, okay. I, exactly the same thing. Uh, you're, uh, you're also connecting with camp people and you're bringing people together. And I know at Warrow that's been very, very valuable. Yeah. Well, and that's the whole premise that behind my board approving us running Think Camp at like, no like there's no gain for us in running think camp but the deal is we run it during a time in the week when we wouldn't normally have a rental right weekdays in november are not a high rental uh market so i can run a, a three or four day conference for camping professionals or a get together right just come and hang out and and um and go from there dan hold on sorry um there you're good to go Oh, sorry about that. Um, That's a problem. Uh, so I just was thinking of a few outlier ones at the last place I was at. Um, cool. So uh, if you have a, a wooded area, um, what's really popular is 3D archery shoots. Um, so you can look this up on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's pretty funny. There's like definitely a, a whole subculture of people that drive around and go courses and basically go from station to station on a course and will shoot um you know a foam deer or foam bear um and a lot of people have wooded property they haven't developed but it actually draws in a fair amount of cars you charge them you could just grill right there um easy you know no heat involved for lack of better words you could do something you do yourself in terms of setup um so that's one that works out really well um another is uh maple sugaring um so um you could if you have a lot of maple trees tap those trees and then boil that down into sap. Um, it is, uh, to boil that sap down into uh, syrup. Um, it, it can be costly to get set up, but once you're moving, um, it can actually be very lucrative in that sense. Um, maple syrup costs have, uh, have gone up in terms of like what you could charge. So um, you could actually, but you, you do have to make an equipment um, investment in that sense. And then um, just groups in terms of we haven't talked about uh, that could be utilized by local uh, day camps or even overnight camps is uh, embracing sports teams, um, as particularly at the high school level. Um, they love going on retreats and would love to have a facility with big open fields and exclusivity and don't need any programming and just really need food. Um, and then for day camps, um, I know a number of them uh, that host actually the local town sports team um, so for instance, if you have little league in your town and they play on your baseball fields, that's people right. coming onto your property every day Smart. and seeing your camp and making sure they see your, you know, you put up a few billboards saying you have summer camp, um, it'll, it'll benefit in multiple ways. So I just, um, yeah, can't reiterate enough that there's a number of options to do that don't add any costs in terms of staffing or, or anything. So. I visited a camp this summer in New Brunswick um, and they were the town pool. So they had an yeah. agreement with the town yep. that they would, you know, the town paid for the lifeguard and paid for the upkeep of the pool. And the, so it was this weird, the pool's there, here we go. And, and they got a ton of people every day just using their pool and doing swimming lessons out of it and, and whatnot and met all the codes because they're a health inspected, right? It's a public pool already. 
we've seen uh, we have a big local fly fish community that's really popular. We're right near the river, and so yes. we advertise to local fishermen groups and fisher women groups, fisher people, um, that they can come and stay at camp as a home base. Uh, many of these folks are looking for like rustic, rustic housing, and it might not be a group, but it could be individuals that are coming for a week to fish or a weekend. Um, if you allow hunting on your property, that could be something to think about and look at. There's obviously marching band camps have been very lucrative for a lot of camps that I know that are luxurious enough to have fields. What must that be like? I do not know personally at my facility, uh, but I know for Camp Skyline, they run their entire like spring, like fall season on marching band camps. And that makes up a significant portion of their income. I know cross country camps are always looking for camps to rent that have wooded trails. Um, and so thinking about those rental potentials that again are no program, just food is a really nice way to get your feet wet. That's the beauty of a fasting weekend camp. I think that you save mm -hmm. all that money on food and you're teaching people about the value of fasting. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, the other one I've thought for years and, and I've talked about it, I have not implemented it, but like the idea of a music festival on site, uh, you have to have the right sort of layout for multiple stages and, and all of those things and the right sort of remote location so that other people aren't just going to wander in. Um, I know that I believe it's Rockmont in North Carolina does a music festival. And what I learned from visiting them a few years ago is that if you're going to do it, do it after camp because yeah. they said like camp looks great until like this weekend in June when like three or 4,000 people come and it just ruins everything, like all the grass is ruined and then you spend all summer trying to get it back. And so I'm, I'm looking at a Labor Day music festival is what, what I'm looking yeah. at. French Woods and, um, and the border of Pennsylvania and New York did, does one that, um, yeah, it's, it's massive, it's huge, people love it. But um, yes, yeah, they do it after camp, they do it Labor Day weekend. So. Yeah, because like Jalisa said, it's it's a wear and tear on your facility, and you have to be you have to be ready for those things um, for any group, right? That where are they going to park? All of the logistics, and, and and the belief is when when we're looking at how to use our facilities, I think people get stuck in well, we don't have we don't have space for that, or we don't we we can't do that. Years ago, somebody called up and said, "Can you?" Um, could I bring 5,000 people or 3,000 people to your facility? And I was like, well, tell me more. Like, I only have 200 beds. And they said, well, it, it'd be like a jamboree tile style thing. And, you know, they'd have tents. And I said, well, if you give me a year's notice um, and you do it after the first of August, I could, you know, because in my mind, I get, I get the farmer who rents our land to grow winter wheat. So that field, the field I need, which is 40 acres where they can set up whatever they want right that is ready to use in august and then the rest is just logistics you know porta potties tents cooking to right like all of that stuff is just logistics for three thousand people i'm i'm more than willing to work out logistics and that's where <laughs> burning man started yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yep. burning pierce williams <laughs> you can't no. because we're fire safe that is true it's very <laughs> Lisa. I want to mention, yeah, it's not a rental, but something that Camp Nuevo has done that's kind of off the beaten path is that we have our own catering business. So it's not anyone who's renting camp, but we have, it's unrelated business income. So it's taxed income that comes in because it's non-mission-based service. So this goes back to what Dan was talking about and making sure you do your homework and you're following the law when you get audited for all of your new income coming in. Um, but we bring in a significant portion of our budget now through this catering business. So we run offsite caterings, we have you know, a full banquet set up. What's been really great about that is that it's been able to retain for us an executive chef year round and now a year round sous chef. And I know for camps, one of the struggles is always getting good yes kitchen yes, staff yes, yes. year round, year after year. And so for us to have that position, it wouldn't be possible without that income. We started really slow. So we started with allowing other caterers to come into our kitchen and cook for these events and then made our way up to hourly and then made our way up to full-time. And then with this full-time staff person, we didn't start with linens and chafing dishes. Like it was all built up one stage at a time and we're still building. Uh, but we've had a catering today uh, for tacos for a random 
like company in town for 60 people. I don't even know where it went, but then all the staff got tacos for lunch. How nice is that? Um, so kind of thinking outside the box too, I know Camp Roger, who's locally, they rent out their kitchen to a local caterer off season. So instead of trying to make their own catering business, they rent out that portion. And then their camp always smells like chocolate chip cookies because Tuesday is chocolate chip cookie baking day. So there's a nice benefit that they're always real estate ready. Yeah, I love that. I definitely know camps that, that rent out their kitchen to catering companies because it's big space. It's hard to find um, and ones that are ready to go. And on that point, just about food, one of the things that a lot of people, when, when you look at the camping world, a lot of people do their rentals. Um, you have to use their food, right? So, and, and trust me, that's where money is to be made if, if they're buying your food and, and you're cooking for them. But there is a whole subset of people who want to rent and cook for themselves, um, different cultural groups. So um, a lot of um, a lot of Asian cultural groups rent uh, Pierce Williams and, and we couldn't provide a local caterer who would be able to service their food needs um, and different not different religions rent us. And and what one of the things we do is we we did have a caterer that we used to send people the menu and and she worked her way out of thirty thousand dollars a year in business like she just her customer service sucked and then that reflected on us and we're like cook for yourselves here's your kitchen it it puts more wear and tear on your kitchen a little bit but not not a tremendous amount and um and it what it's done for us is you know they we give them a sort of guideline about here's here's some things you need to know for cooking for yourself but very few of our groups complain about it anymore at all. We, we haven't spent that much time talking about family camping. Um, uh, I, I know a number of camps do this um, and uh, it's easy way to get your families invested in camp. Um, it's just the expectations are so different. I just can't reiterate enough that the, the over under on, 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 on the revenue you bring in is not the same as camp. So just make sure you really do the numbers before you, you do it. Um, just, you know, like holding your summer staff for an extra week. And then, um, you know, you obviously have less staff. You don't have to meet these ratios that you would have to meet the rest of the, the summer. But um, just food, typically you have to do a much nicer job, uh, program supplies, you know, <laughs> much less understanding if you run out of candle, like for candle making, you know, just stuff like that. Like, um, uh, and cleanliness is huge. Like you have to do a deep clean twice, basically. You have to do a deep clean before they come in and then you have to do a deep clean after they leave. So just, um, fam but family camp has been successful for a lot of overnight camps, a lot. I'm even toying with doing it at the, at our day camp, um, uh, in, a, in a way of adding revenue. And, um, there's a dead time essentially between day camp and uh, the start of school where staffing's really hard and, and what if we did programs for families, you come with the day with your family and we'll, we'll host you and, you know, and make it work that way. So, uh, but yeah, just wanted to kind of give that a plug. And uh, we flow, I, when I arrived here, family camp was at the beginning of the summer, not at the end, uh, which I at first found really frustrating, but that now it's a great way for us to say to potential parents, Hey, you come with your kid July long weekend, and, you know, there'll still be some space in some other camps and you can sign them up after you meet our staff and meet us. Camp Nuevo is unique that we run year round community events, at least one every month. So like this weekend, I've got on Friday, Luna Fest, shout out to Women in Camping Summit, uh, yeah. traveling film festival. And so you might think, oh no, I need a ton of staff to run a program. For us, it's setting up a projector screen and a projector, having a speaker and some chairs and a big room to watch a movie. And that's bringing in, we got the event sponsored by a local women's group. And so for us, it's a nice way to have a fundraiser. So all of the people that are coming in, it's free by donation only. And then on Sunday, we've got a daddy daughter dance for 300 dads and their daughters coming out to camp. We've got a DJ who volunteers his time. Our kitchen makes cookies. There's very low cost for us going into it because it's a dance floor and some cookies and they pay seven bucks a person to come in. It's not a lot of income, but it's great uh, community investment, which I really appreciate. But one event that we've done that I just love, that was very little staffing, but really cool, 
is a progressive paddle dinner. So we got volunteers from our lake and we're on a chain of several lakes to open up their homes and cook a portion of like a meal. And then uh, participants came and they rented a kayak or even brought their own. They launched from our beach and then traveled to these different homes and got portions of their meal um, at each stop. And you get to tour a house. So for people who love like parade of homes and food, it's like the dream. Um, and that's something that's <laughs> unique if you've got good connections to your neighbors. There's no cost coming out of your pocket if, if the neighbors are willing to volunteer to cook an appetizer for 20 people. It's a great way to get people out and paddling at your waterfront. Um, and so there's cool events you can do that are low staffing, um, that'll bring in a little bit of income, but a lot of friend raising that could lead to future income because they might know someone who needs to rent a camp or they might be willing to send kids to your camp. So I think when you're looking at diversifying your income, you have to really see the big picture and see that everyone who you could reach if you can do it and maximize your time um, in a way that's going to behoove you to, to, to get the most dollars in and the most mission service in, I think is a key point of that too. I love, and yeah, that's so creative. I, it's really out of the box. It's awesome. Um, any others? It's stuff that you've seen work that you think is awesome, missed opportunities. I, I think family camp's a great point, Dan. Um, I think there's tons of demand for family camps that, can't, that camps are could be failing. Um, in Ontario, we know of a, a, a YMCA camp that bought the neighbor camp to open up just a family camp. Uh, and it's full all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's just... Uh, Costs are different, you know, you just have to keep an eye on that and you have to manage expectations, you know, but like if you're a camp that's all platform tents and you know, you know, like you allow certain things to happen at your camp, it could be really great, you know, like it, it doesn't have to be crazy. Um, you know, we've, we've also looked at like, if we were to develop part of our land and have an RV area, um, what would that cost? You know, like uh, that could be very popular as well. Um, uh, the, I'll share one of the coolest events I ever did um, uh, was a battle of the bands. Um, didn't make a ton of revenue, oh, but wow. we did it at the local high school and um, we could easily host it at our place too, but just the school didn't want to take it on, but they were happy that we were doing it. And we got a few counselors to volunteer and it was just awesome. That was, that was one of my favorite non-summer camp programs we ran and um, to provide a safe place for teens on a weekend. Uh, you know, that's, that's me and every camp's mission. Uh, but yeah, that was, I just wanted to put that one out there. When I was at the Northeast Y um, conference with Dan last week, somebody was talking about one of the things that they have done um, in uh, Connecticut, I think, where they have taken on the, the kids' road races associated with like 10Ks and, and um, triathlons and stuff. And they've taken on managing the, the kids' races of that because everybody wants to have a kids' race there, but they don't really want to manage it. And then it's just something else that they can, you know, camps can show off their staff and their skills and their organizing. And they've taken on that. And I don't know whether or not it's a moneymaker, but I thought it was a really creative way to get seen in the community could become something that, um, it, like Nuego spun off a catering company, you could become a race management company um, because that is a real thing. Um, and uh, do kids try to try or, um, I mean, any of those kind of kids programming that other bigger organizations may not want to do the kids part of it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I think um, when I when Dan when you're talking about family camps, uh, we also hosted one of our many failed um, shoulder season programs was a family camp, um, and it just again didn't fit within what what we do well. And um, I also learned that um, I don't do well. I do well with adults and I do well with kids, but adults and kids together, it just, I'm not great at that. I, I, I judge adult parents very quickly and uh, it, I get very frustrated and irritated. And um, <laughs> you know, I think you also have to know you and, and how, you know, just because it's on your camp, it doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy it. Women's weekends, I don't love either. Cause I, I do feel that, um, at my core, I'm an educator and I'm an, and I, that's how I run my business is through education and communication. And I was building a, a fire in, in, you know, in a fireplace and um, it's early in the morning and I'm 
literally on my knees building this fire and this woman comes in not making eye contact with me and she says oh could we at least have a fire going in here as i'm building the fire and i remember in that moment i said to myself oh well i will never be leading um women's weekends again and i don't do women's weekends and it's because I would have had, it, if it was a staff member, I would have had a conversation about that comment. It was a camper, I would have, but with, with you know, a client, yeah. I just said, that that's a great idea. And I can continue <laughs> my, so I, I, think, I think knowing you and, and understanding what you're, if, if, if you're dreading it, then maybe somebody else can do it. And I have some really great staff members that come back that are no longer, uh, c can commit to a whole summer, but they love Women's Weekends and it really works for them. Me, it just drives me absolutely mental. Um, and I'm not, I don't, you know, listen very well. I don't hide my face very well either. So this, you know, plays against me. Our organization, our camp is really, really small. We can't expand any more than we can. Our time on when people can stay on our camp is very limited. In the spring, it has one of the highest condensed amount of black flies uh, in the world. There's a study and it is where we live. And uh, at the, and, and then the weather, it just, it just, it's not great for us. So but what do we have we, as resource? We have staff members and, um, and talking about, you know, keeping people employed throughout the year and bringing in an income. And we are in education and we do work with children. And so working with schools for motivational activities, team building activities, leadership skills, and using your staff, training your staff on how to run these programs, bringing them to schools. Um, I've hosted parent and kid communication sessions where I talk to parents about how do you, you know, how to talk with your kids, sticky situations, but I bring five or six staff members in and they're my panel and, and the parents get to ask them questions. So what can you do uh, outside of your camp? What can you do that's not maybe on your facility and how can you involve your staff? Um, we put a lot of energy into training our staff and, and, you know, giving them these type of opportunities is great for retention, but it's also great for finances for them and then also for your organization. So how can you take what you do well um, on your camp and take it outwardly is something to also perhaps explore. I think to add in, we've all talked about the struggles of being like a northern camp that shuts down off season. That's all familiar to a lot of us. I have a lot of ties to the south and my friends in Florida, one really unique thing that they've done at Camp Timpucci is to open up their camp for hurricane relief. Um, so when hurricanes have hit the bays in Florida and volunteers are looking to come and stay at a place to help with the efforts or the Red Cross is looking for a place to stay. Um, that's a, a great use of rental for your camp. Our friends next door at their camp have really tried to get their horses utilized off season. So they've done trail rides for their horses and that's not at your facility per se, you know, and staying overnight, but utilizing some of your program items. Um, and then really reaching out to those affinity groups. There's a camp nearby that just built an indoor pickleball courts because they had so many avid pickleball players looking for a place to practice and we don't so have smart. a local pickleball team. And so they just had a pickleball cool. tournament, a weekend pickleball tournament where yep. people came and played all day like you would have a softball tournament. And then the biggest thing for us, once you find a good rental group, like that, that camp that you're like, oh, this is great. This week works every year for us, locking them into a multi-year contract and saying your rates will only increase by this percentage every year if you lock in these dates for the next three years, I think is really ideal for building your budget and building your calendar. Because once you find those oh. groups, you want to keep them. Um, that's always the best model. Is, is, yeah. Uh, pickleball is uh, like cats me out right now. I don't know what cliche to use, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. it is a very big program in the facilities that I'm working with. Very big program, and people are very very demanding about it. It seems like it filled the void that racquetball left behind when it when it fell. So yeah, and I think that's a good that's a good good thing to look at. It's a good indicator as um, as all of our populations are aging looking for seniors programming again you have to be specific about it there's lots of camps that could not do seniors programming they might have the buildings or the staff for it but couldn't get people around easily um, on their facilities and but i think that there's tons of potential in seniors programming for camps and in general if you uh fitness trends right now um group classes are up across the board for for fitness centers so like 
you know, like, I mean, if you think about that, people want to get together and they want a facilitator. That's essentially what a group fitness class is. They want to move. But, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful ideas um, and appreciate all of your contributions on that. What I'd like to do is move us into our tool of the week. Uh, if you are drawn in because you're a big fan of Jaleesa, and this is your first time listening to the, you're, you're the Jaleesa crew, your first time listening to Camp Hacker, uh, Tool of the Week, we ask each of our panelists to bring something that makes them a better camp director. Uh, and Jaleesa, on, in honor of your return to Camp Hacker, I'd like to let you go first, please. Sure. Gabs is excited about mine. It's a fun one. So this is called Gwenny Bee, and it's a clothing rental company. So just talking to my lady pros, sorry, fellas, there's nothing equivalent out there for you. All of my male friends and colleagues are very disappointed, but there's several of these out there with different names. This is the one that I subscribe to and I'm a big fan of. I've been a subscriber for about five years of it. Um, it's like a $40 a month subscription and it's essentially an endless closet. So you rent clothes. My subscription is like two outfits at a time. And it's like Netflix used to be when Netflix was DVDs, where it's free shipping back and forth. And you have a queue where you're like, oh, I would like these outfits next. And they ship you what's next in your queue. And then you ship it back when you're done wearing it. There's no tags on things, but I found myself as a young camping professional moving up in the field, heading to a lot of meetings, doing a lot of things with donors. And I found that I had far more tie-dye t-shirts than I did like appropriate outfits to wear for the setting. Nice. Yep. And at my salary, I don't want to go out every weekend and buy a new outfit to match the meeting that I need to have. Um, and with so many seasons in Michigan, it just wasn't practical. So this has been really fun, especially for like the conference coming up next week. I always like to think about like dress for the job you want, not for the job you have. I always like to look really professional in a setting. And it's just fun to go shopping uh, in an endless closet that you don't have to pay a lot for. So Gwenny B, check it out. I'm a big fan. That is awesome. A great idea. A great idea. Joe, what's your tool? My tool of the week this week is a tickler file. This is a, um, I first heard about it years ago from uh, Getting Things Done and David Allen. Um, and I realized it is something I use every day. That's the whole purpose. Um, I figured out a way to use it every day. It's essentially, you can also look it up. The link shows you 43 files. So it's 12 months plus 31 days. And it's just a way, as much as we're trying to get, I, I would love a paperless society. The reality is there's lots of paper still in my life. So a packing slip that needs to go with a bill that comes in or something that I need to deal with three weeks from now where am I going to put that sheet of paper? And the tickler file just says, okay, well, it's January um, and, or it's February now. And I need a, some, I know I'm only going to be office for a few more days this month. And so I can put paper in that file and know that I'm going to get to that file that day. Um, and the 31 month days just keep moving forward to the next month. And I, I bought it from the Getting Things Done company years ago. You can make your own by going to Staples and buying 43 files and, and just making it happen. Um, but it is a great way to sort of store paper and know you're going to see it again. What I do it at the end of every day is I take my bullet journal and I take my paper calendar that I have and I put it in the next day's tickler file so that I, I'm forced to go to the file to get that stuff out, move that file to the to the to the next month and and then I can I can process it from there. So the the tickler file, which uh, I've I've put a Wikipedia link up. Excellent. 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 Uh, how about it, Gab? Um, <clears throat> my tool of the week is uh, was recommended to me by Ruby Compton, who I speak with on Camp Code with Beth Allison. And it is a video teleprompter. And um, it's something that you can, it's, a, it's an app that can go on your iPad or your iPhone or your Android phone. And you can literally write up your script 
and as you're recording you, the script will scroll in front of your eyes and it will look as if you were looking directly into the camera and i think this is great for um if if you want to do an instructional video for your families on where to meet with your camp bus um, for staff members on what to expect on the first day of staff training um etc 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 and you don't have to be the person in front of the camera you can get some of your staff members to do it um, so you have different people but this will help with uh, you know rambling goes away and and precise messaging which is what families and staff members need is that precise messaging and um, I, I love this tool and you can get it for free or you can pay the $24 for for the the pro licensing but Ruby says both work great good one uh, Dan what's your tool yeah, um, so my tool is actually uh, an Instagram account. Um, so I uh, chose Adam Grant's Instagram account. If you don't know Adam Grant, he is the author of Give and Take, A Revolutionary Approach to Success, Originals, which is a book we've talked about in the pod, and Option B uh, with Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, but just, um, I am a very self-motivated person and um, I often look at books and different things to keep me going. And uh, I started following Adam Grant on Instagram a little while ago. And on top of being an author, he's an organizational psychology professor from the Wharton School for UPenn. And just, um, I'm just finding literally everything he's posting on his Instagram match up perfectly with our profession and just a little bit of morning tidbit I need to keep me moving. So um, yeah, highly recommend it. Worth the follow. That's a great one. I love Adam's stuff. Um, my tool of the week is just a, a gadget bag of some kind. Um, I, if you're watching YouTube, you can, uh, the, the YouTube watchers can see this, everybody else cannot. It is just a simple folding bag that has several compartments in it that I put stuff that I take with me when I go to conferences. Truth be told, this is Gab's tool because this is stolen from a Waro thing where they have a kit um that they keep with their projector with all the different possible connect connectors um, i'm able to edit because i can just keep whatever connector i need for my computer um, but i do take this with me and i would recommend that um the camps would be inspired by waro and keep just a, a small toolkit i've got this little soft um zipper bag with two that folds in half looks like a book that's got stuff in it and that helps connectors it's for guest speakers it's for staff um so they can connect and do presentations it could be for your guest groups we've talked so much about guest groups and different kinds in my folder in particular um i keep uh, my name tags i keep a clicker for doing presentations i have my own hdmi cord because i've gotten in trouble different i couldn't get connected to a, a thing that i wanted um, to a projector um, and I have different kinds of power cables, different uh, plugs, etc. The other thing that I do that I would recommend is take and put your name and phone number on a sticker on that uh, so that people can return it to you. If you, you know, are helping volunteer, helping to run a, a conference and they say, hey, can you can camps bring their projectors for us? Happens often at small camp conferences. Um, all of that stuff is labeled. So the, the bag itself doesn't really matter. This one's by a group called BUBM. And um, I think Amazon Basics has ripped them off and built their own also. Um, but it is handy. Um, like Jalisa, I like to present, I like to show up looking in good shape. Um, one of the things that I've discovered over the years is that um, I have a nice briefcase, et cetera, but this bag has my name and my phone number on it in giant letters in case I leave it somewhere, in case someone borrows it from me, which has happened more times than I can count at conferences. Uh, it is obvious and obnoxious how to return it. Uh, if any of you are watchers of Casey Neistat's YouTube, um, he is a big fan of putting his name on stuff in giant letters. And uh, if I saw the wisdom of that in this one. It may not look the best, but it, everybody knows that it's mine and it can get returned to me. Um, so that is, that's my suggestion. I would say, uh, just remind you all, uh, again, Jaleesa fans, new to, new to us and the tool of the week, if you go to camphacker.tv slash podcast, you will see um, all of the notes from today's call and links to all of the different things, like how to get your own um, 43 folders, ticker file, uh, all of these things that we talked about today will be in there. So um, 
so you can find all that. We should uh, take just a minute and say thank you so much to Matt, who is our executive producer of podcasting here at Go Camp Pro. He has been our longtime editor and producer and blog post and show note writer, and we're super grateful to him for all of the work that, that he does. So thanks to Matt for, for doing that. Um, you should also have the ability in whatever app that you're listening to us on, if you're doing the podcast version, that you can leave us a review on that app. Um, we'd be super, super grateful if you do that. If you're watching on YouTube, if you give us a thumbs up and then subscribe, um, that also helps us help help helps us help more camp pros. So I want to thank everybody who's done that so far, and uh, so fun to see all of the different reviews in different iTunes stores. Um, that's a really cool part of what we get to do. So thank you. Uh, Dan, how can people get in touch with you if, if they have any follow-up questions? Yeah, um, uh, my email is just dan.weir uh, at ymcali.org. Uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, everything at danlovescamp. Uh, also danlovescamp.com. Amazing. Thanks for being here, Dan. You're welcome. Gab? You can check, uh, you can follow me on Instagram um, at Gabrielle Rail or check out where I work at waro.com, O-U-A-R-E-A-U.com. Thanks, Gab. Jalisa? You can email me at my first name, Jalisa, which is spelled a little weird, J-A-L-I-S-A -S at Camp Nuego, which is N-E-W-A-Y-G-O.org, or find me at campnuego.org. Amazing. Jalisa, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks. Yeah, so happy to be here. Great ideas from everybody. Yeah, really awesome. Joe, how about you? Uh, if people want to reach out, they can do it two ways. They can come to the Pierce Williams site, which is campisbetter.com, or they can come to my site, which is uh, yoyojoe.com, Y-O-Y-O-J-O-E. Um, and you can reach out and buy some of this art in the background if you would like, so I can make more art. I need to sell this stuff to make more. If you're you're a listener, Joe has an it's, awesome project that he's. It's making. wood art. It's yes. very campy. It would look great on your office. I have, <laughs> I have one on my office wall. So right, all right. Thanks, Joe. Not a problem. All right. So once again, go to camphacker.tv to find the show notes from today. I um, want to thank everybody who has been the long-term listeners. We want to thank those who support the show, who pay for the show um, on uh, Patreon. We're so grateful to them. And uh, again, the community of camp that is so open and sharing makes this sh show possible. So if you have any more ideas or things you'd like us to talk about or cover again, and we've been doing this for nine years now, so there's some topics could definitely use us covering them again. Um, but just, just send me a message, Travis at GoCamp.pro uh, and GoCampPro on Instagram, et cetera. You can let me know and I can work with Matt to get people scheduled in to talk about topics that you need covered. Also, if you want to be a guest on the show, please let us know that way too. Be awesome. Thanks for the evening, friends. Mm -hmm.